Is cardio making you weak or is it killing your gains? And we're gonna start right now. So what is cardio? This is a simple definition, okay? It can be a little bit more advanced, but any type of exercise that's gonna elevate your heart rate for a prolonged period of time. So let's say five to 10 minutes would be a semi-prolonged period of time. After we get past 10 minutes and we have our heart rate remain elevated for that extended period of time, that's gonna be the definition of cardio. So what is muscular hypertrophy? If we wanna see a increase in muscular size, muscular mass, that's gonna be hypertrophic. That will be muscular hypertrophy and that's gonna occur through increasing tendon and ligament size. That's gonna occur through myofibrillar hypertrophy and that will also occur through sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. And then the important part now is to see the mechanism that causes those specific types of adaptations. So what's the problem with cardio and strength training or cardio and resistance based training? In the past, you know, everybody has always said, myself included, sadly, cardio will kill your gains. Cardio will make you small. You won't be able to increase your bench press if you're doing cardio. You won't be able to increase your squat if you're doing cardio. That might not actually hold true. And I think what sort of pisses me off is that I've had some of the most hypertrophic individuals. One person I'm thinking of specifically is division one, all American, Pete Renda who is an absolute specimen physically, as hypertrophic as they come, and he was in a sport with cardio, wrestling, and so I still had that horrible false belief that cardio would make you small. So one of the first times this belief that cardio is gonna crush your gains really stood out to me and really started to trigger me to think a little bit differently was when I was interviewing Judy Anderson. So she's a professor and probably one of the most published researchers around satellite cells. So satellite cells are these little cells that live just outside of a muscle cell and a muscle fiber and that when they get stimulated then they can heal and repair donate their myonuclei to that cell and then that helps improve the strength of that specific area of that specific region when they're studying mice they would immobilize an entire leg but the other three legs the mouse would be able to move on their treadmill and they would be able to actually do things like cardio-based training and so what they saw is that that cardio-based training would stimulate nitric oxide, okay? So nitric oxide would then get released. It's almost like that semi-runner's high that you might get after a couple minutes of doing endurance-based work. That nitric oxide then stimulates that satellite cell to start to move and then proliferate and then get into that muscle cell. If you want information around that, click on that link down below. We have a full podcast with Judy Anderson where she explains all this stuff in depth. And so we're also seeing that muscle capillarization can lead to a tremendous diffusion in regards to muscle to blood exchange. So we're gonna see more capillarization in individuals that have a little bit more of aerobic capacity, that have a little bit more exposure to endurance-based training. So how does this impact hypertrophy? If we have a little bit more of that muscle capillarization, then we can transport more blood, we can transport more red blood cells, we can transport more nutrients, we can transport more oxygen and hormones to help repair and increase muscle protein synthesis. So what kind of adaptations do we see from cardio that actually help? And I wanna take it back to when I was 290 pounds and I was in college, I would go back in the fall to Penn State and bloated out of my mind. We would go back and we would start doing sets of 12, sets of 15 in the weight room. And I would be absolutely dying for like out of breath, just feeling like I was gonna vomit everywhere. But one of the things that we actually did, which looking back was actually positive, we started to do aerobic work on the old Schwinn Airdynes and we would run hills. And so over time, what was happening is I was improving blood vessels or angiogenesis was occurring inside of my body so that by that second and third week, I didn't feel like I was gonna vomit everywhere. In fact, my endurance got a lot better and I could then actually get stronger with the 12 rep ranges, the 15 rep rep ranges. So that angiogenesis, those important blood vessels 
are really, really important for helping to transport energy, helping to transport oxygen, helping to transport any type of nutrients to help with recovery. Researchers Thomas et al. expected some sense of growth, some sense of satellite cell myonuclei donation, satellite cell proliferation from having a greater capillary to fiber ratio. This is a term that I even highlighted in my notes, capillary to fiber perimeter exchange index. That is going to be a term that I think becomes a huge factor moving forward because it's gonna have an influence on things like myokines. And this is all stuff that you can learn from Stephen Cornish. We've done a podcast with him in the past. And now going back to the test is that what researchers were looking for is what was happening and, and based off their hypothesis, if they were doing aerobic-based conditioning versus just resistance-based training, what type of satellite cell movement will we see? So now what they ended up setting up was a really unique six-week time frame where the individual individual would be biking on one leg. So they would be on an electric bike and they would be cycling on one leg in a stationary position. Okay. So the one leg would be totally static and the other leg would be pedaling. And they did this three times a week for six straight weeks. And so what they wanted to see then over time is they were testing that VO2 max. They were looking at things that were influencing aerobic capacity. And then what that was then doing for the capillary to fiber perimeter exchange index. Because they were gonna end up testing resistance-based training after this six-week aerobic setup, and the individual essentially became their own control. So you have one leg, let's say hypothetically, my right leg is pedaling. Now my left leg is not pedaling, and I'm gonna do that three days a week for six weeks, and we're gonna slowly increase our intensity based off the cadence that's prescribed. Every two to three workouts, we're gonna increase by about 4%. So we're gonna improve our VO2 max, we're gonna improve our ability to apply that aerobic capacity in the leg that's actually being trained while the other leg is still the control and it's not being trained. Now, uh, I broke my arm when I was 17 and the doctor had said, okay, let's take this, you know, your left arm, you can't use it all, but let's use your right arm and you can lift with your right arm. There should be about 10 to 15% strength transfer. So the gains that I would have here, if I gained hundred pounds on my bench on my right side, I should gain about 10 to 15 pounds on my left side. Now, both legs, what they did, went through a full leg training system that was three days a week. And so during this 10 week resistance-based training, the athlete or the individual was trained bilaterally. And this was 14 people, about 22 years of age, men and women. And so they were doing leg presses three sets of 10 to 12 and the last set was done to failure they were doing back squats they were doing hamstring curls they were doing calf raises and they were doing leg extensions so all of those movements mainly targeting the thighs so the way the researchers were looking to see the success of the aerobic conditioning versus the resistance training or the lack of success is that they took a baseline muscle biopsy and then after that six weeks of aerobic based training they took a muscle biopsy again to see what happened what type of adaptation was actually going on what was the cross-sectional area of those specific muscles, the vastus lateralis, anywhere in the quadriceps essentially that they were looking at. And then what was that myonuclei donation that we would end up seeing? And some of this would then theoretically show us does aerobic based training increase cross-sectional area for these specific muscles? So what did Thomas find? In the individual leg that had done aerobic based conditioning, after they went through that 10 weeks of resistance-based training, they saw those greater levels of cross-sectional areas, so a greater amount of muscular hypertrophy. And this is from the capillary to fiber perimeter exchange index ratio. There wasn't a much larger amount of blood vessels, but the blood vessels themselves were actually larger in size, and that led to greater transport, greater recovery, greater healing, and then greater hypertrophy. In the aerobic base leg, the aerobic trained leg with resistance based training, that leg saw increases in size in type one, type two, and the mixed fiber type. Whereas the leg that just did resistance based training didn't see any increase in cross-sectional area in type one fibers, and it saw a very, very small yet significant increase in type two fiber cross-sectional area. So what do they see with satellite cells and myonuclei donation? Almost the exact same result occurred. Type one, type two, that mixed fiber type. All saw greater amounts of satellite cell proliferation in the aerobic-based leg that was also resistance-based trained. 
Whereas just the resistance based legs saw very small amounts of satellite cell proliferation, satellite cell donation. And then what about aerobic capacity and strength in lean body mass? The leg that was doing the aerobic based conditioning, that leg saw a much greater improvement with VO2 max. Now, after the 10 weeks of resistance based training, VO2 max essentially returned back to baseline. But obviously that leg that was actually doing aerobic based training saw that improvement during that six weeks initially. So if you wanna increase your aerobic capacity, you should do aerobic based training. How profound. Now, the big factor here is that with fat free mass, with lean body mass, okay, inside of the leg, Thomas et al saw 1.8 pounds of an increase in fat free mass. This is a little bit higher in the leg that did do aerobic based work and also did resistance training, albeit insignificant in regards to how science is done and whether or not it was statistically significant, but it was still slightly larger in that leg. How can I apply this in a gym with 200 plus members with a whole bunch of world-class athletes? What can I do with this information? And that first key step is just recognizing muscle capillarization. We can then understand that power-based athletes, strength-based athletes can indeed benefit from a little bit of endurance-based work. We don't want it to have a, a significant impact where it can really hurt their production, so you've got to play around with that, but there is some benefit to aerobic-based training. If you just put in 20 to 30 minutes, and this is going to be beginner, intermediate, or even power-based athletes or strength-based athletes that have never done endurance-based work. I would say elite level bodybuilders, they've already done that work, so they probably have a decent uh, muscle capillarization. But power-based athletes typically don't do that. Neither do strength athletes and neither do beginner or intermediate athletes. So start to introduce that into their training and that's going to fuel capillary to fiber perimeter exchange index. That's a key word that we have to remember here when we're talking about hypertrophic gains. But remember, there is a point where too much cardio can have a negative impact on your overall swollenness, and that's typically gonna be done on a daily basis. If you do cardio on a daily basis around 50 to 60 minutes, that will have a negative impact on your overall hypertrophy. Take this with a little bit of grain of salt. If you're a world-class bodybuilder, you know, you probably already have that, that exchange index taken care of, but if you haven't ever really done endurance-based training, I do recommend you know 20 to 30 minutes at a nice, easy tempo, and you will see some some dominance, you will see some improvement in your overall condition. And this is stuff that we're implementing right here at Garage Strength with our world-class athletes that use the app Peak Strength. So make sure you head over to peakstrength.app where you can pick up our app for free for seven free days of training. You can enter your goals, your specific PRs, and your specific peak date. And if you struggle with time management, we even have rest periods and we recommend those weights specifically to what you want to accomplish. You can go to Google Play Store, the Apple Store, or again, peakstrength.app. Because remember, freaks, if you wanna become a champion, you've always gotta cultivate your power. Peace.